symbol of excellence in sports entertainment. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to my world. And of course we couldn't do it without the hall of famer himself, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, put your hands together. It's double J Jeff Jarrett. Jeff, how are you, man? Roll tide. Howdy Conrad Thompson. We got a Vols win. We got a Titans win. Things are rocking and rolling. We got a huge event this Saturday. We may or may not get into, we got a hell of a topic. We got uh NWA world title to chat about. Uh, maybe no baseball today, no Russell quest today. Although we do have a launch date. It's coming out in May, but that's another conversation. But Connie, how are you doing after your R and R last week? You look Man, great. Excited to be back here with you so much to talk about, but let's start right at the top this Saturday night. Jeff Jarrett returns to pay-per-view <laughs> now. Not like he's been gone very long. This, I think, will be your fifth pay per view this year. Is that right? Oh my gosh! Let's say you beat up Effie in his own home in his own home field advantage. Just tore his ass up at the Hammerstein Ballroom, biggest GCW show ever. You walked out with your hand raised. Yes, sir. And then you were a referee for the NWA show uh, for the world title match with Cardona in my, in my hometown, in, August, in your own hometown in Nashville, and then. You were a special guest referee in the co-main event, I guess you might call it, of SummerSlam Stadium Show in your own hometown. And then you uh, took Ric Flair's ass to the woodshed on no, paper. Did I ever? We'll get and, into that. <laughs> and now I think this is your fifth. You're not even. You start. You ended last year and started this year thinking I'm not going to wrestle again. <laughs> I'm done wrestling. Like I do other stuff now. I mean, look at my baseball team, and I'm doing this podcast stuff, and I don't even want to talk about the overseas stuff yet. And I got this video game, and I'm, pff, I'm not wrestling. And now. After GCW, after the NWA, after WWE, after Jim Crockett promotions, here comes AEW. You're like, I don't even know the, the reference, but everybody's posting pictures of that Marvel character with those gauntlets and all those infinity stones or whatever. You've kind of collected them all, dude. You're, you're going to beat up sting this weekend on pay-per-view. You're forgetting the Nickelback analogy, <laughs> which means you chuckled about it as well. I'm fired <laughs> up Conrad. I just had a hell of a workout in the gym. Uh, I really am. I am psyched. What an opportunity. A um, lot of gratitude with, with the mindset, but as far as the last outlaw goes, uh, ruffled some feathers last week. And, and uh, let's talk forward, about that. All right. on, look about looking forward to dynamite this week. We got rampage, uh, got a sellout house at the Prudential center. It's funny. The, um, we used to do the kind of the loop massive square garden, uh, in NYC. And then we'd go out to long Island and we'd always kind of finish over there in New Jersey. And so, um, I'm pumped, man. And who would have thunk first time I laid eyes on sting was Thanksgiving day, 1985, before I ever had my first match, him and a guy by the name of Jim Helwig showed up at my dad's house on Thanksgiving. And here we are in 2022 and ruffling feathers and looking forward to cracking his head again. So your dad helped get sting in the business. So one day you could crack his ass with a guitar in 2022. Isn't that crazy to think about all these years later, we're full circle. He showed up at your door. Now you showed up at his Darby Allen left with stitches. People got a little upset yesterday or two days ago, whenever that was when, uh, I kind of coined it Sting's last match. And they're like, no, it's not his last match. I said, oh, he doesn't know it yet, but it 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 certainly is. <laughs> I mean, really and truly, it was Effie's last match in January. <laughs> it was Flair's last match in July. And now it's Sting's last match in November. I guess the real question is, once you get done with Sting, because what everybody's really looking forward to with Sting, and I know that you've been taking this personally as you're, a lot of people have those big tires that they flip. You might be familiar with that. Not Jeff. He just cracks guitars over them one after another. He's got a whole truck full of those some bitches. And just, you remember Don West? Well, they got a whole truck full of them at his house. I've seen it. Oh. And he just crushes them one after another. Anyway, people are talking about the great Muda having his last match and Sting being involved. Buddy Sting ain't going to be there. <laughs> Everybody knows if you're trying to go out of the business and you need somebody to run you out of business, 
make one call starts with a 615 area code goes, goes straight to the lake and he'll climb off the lake get off that jet ski and come whip your ass and that's going to happen this saturday awtix.com you can watch it on pay-per-view i know i will be any chance i get to see jeff Jarrett beat up sting sign me up uh, so that'll be fun. And, uh, you did ruffle some feathers last week because you went on TV and you did what you do. You stirred it up. You got people pissed off. You got people talking and they weren't talking necessarily when the segment was over about how you put over Jay lethal, who I would argue, uh, pardon the gimmick infringement for Mr. Brian Myers. He might be the most professional professional wrestler I've ever met. The nicest guy ever a really good human being fantastic performer go out of your way to work with him see him perform whatever big fan of jay lethal and then it was time for you to put over our pal sanjay dutt but then we finished off with the big man and uh i don't know if we're allowed to do this let's just see how it goes let's play the clip of what you had to say oh last week on aew dynamite about giants and wrestling here we go you are will and Sodenham, come on up here Sodenham. This is a legit seven foot five giant. Cameraman started his feet and pan up, slow pan. This isn't no make believe monster who wears red skinny jeans and is produced by the banana nose circus. No, this guy is one in a billion. Why is he one in a billion? That's the name of his Netflix special. He's the only player in the history of the NBA, the history of the National Basketball Association to be born and bred in India. So Sting. We get the idea, a little shot there at a, uh, a giant wearing skinny jeans or a make-believe giant wearing skinny jeans. I think we all knew who you were referencing. And now there's been reports that have come out that Perhaps he's got a little bit of heat backstage on the other channel. And, uh, some people are saying he shows up late. He leaves early. He's got a big star attitude, has bad attitude, big ego, whatever the words are. The point is it might not be going well. And here you are ahead of those reports coming out, making fun of him on the other channel. Got everybody talking. What's the thinking? What's the strategy? And then we'll come back to banana nose. So Conrad, it is truly, I love the industry because if you're not into Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, if you're not into social media, that's the last outlaw, just kind of taking a, a dig at a blanket statement of big men in wrestling and red skinny jeans, just a, an outfit and a circus and all that, that here's a legitimate, which Satnam is, megastar from India. The, the whole, have you seen the Netflix Wonder Billion? No, I'm familiar with it, but I haven't seen it. You, you should watch it. It's really an amazing story. Sotnam came to America, 13, 14 years old, IMG Academy. You know, it, it's really, and, and it the, the, the documentary goes to the night he got drafted in the NBA. So in my mind is, how am I going to put this guy over, but also you can call it old school heat, heat uh, get a reaction be the antagonist, uh, and put this guy over. And so, you know, and you just, I had no idea about Braun and his showing up late or, you know, I didn't know any of that reference. I had, why, no idea why would you, you're not there, Yeah, but, but I was aware of him just kind of being, I don't know if it's naive, uh, whatever you want to call when, when he takes a shot at flippy floppy stuff and blah, 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 blah. It's 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 almost tone deaf because in 2022, when you look at the landscape of all of professional wrestling, of all of sports entertainment, you want to resonate with your audience. And hey, hats off! I think Corey Graves made a great statement that Braun is happy that him and Omos had a great ma match, but at the same time, he he didn't just put one; he put both feet in his mouth and and is 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 knocking flippy flop, which I take offense to because this industry, whether it's the X division, whether it's Lucha Libre, whatever it may be, if we don't have a diversity of 
genres of wrestling and styles of wrestling. I mean, you've talked about AAA. It's a different appetite. But for him to kind of take that shot at it, I just thought, here's a perfect opportunity to draw an analogy and, you know, Braun, whether he's a former softball player or strongman, whatever it is, he's got some accolades, but he's certainly not an NBA basketball player. And look, I'm the antagonist, the last outlaw, so I'm putting my guy over because when you look at the the four of us and you just put over Jay Lethal, which I think his in-ring, when he flips the switch and says, let's go, he's uh, he's really, really, really good. Sanjay? Yeah legit has an incredibly high IQ and that's kind of what I put over uh, Sanjay you know he's one of the only guys when I started TNA hey I can't make the Wednesday show well why not I got to go to class I I'm telling you that put him in a different category for me from day one we've always had a close relationship I brought him on to do projects and we've I've worked with him for years and years and years he is a breed apart and then Sotnam goes without saying so I'm pretty proud of our our, our unit and I wanted to kind of Lay it out like that, and um, Sotnam is a legit giant. Seven five NBA basketball player, incredible athlete. The amount of upside that goes with that guy, and everybody knows my my roots uh, that I've sort of put over in India. So I'm very excited about the things to come. How's that for you, Connie? I uh, I like it, and I think what I learned in there is, and I didn't know this, Brian Strowman was a softball player, so him and Sid have something in common. Oh, oh, maybe it's him or his dad. I don't know. I think well, Bronco softball player's dad was. Or something. I just looked it up. His dad's one of the most legendary softball players of all time. Yes. Can crank a, can crank a ball out. You didn't know I, that? I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't even know that you could be a world-renowned softball player. I, I'm pleading my ignorance. I grew up in Alabama. We got college football and <laughs> baked beans. You know, nothing else. Well uh, so, listen, we've talked about. A couple things. I want to hit two more and then we'll get into our topic, which by the way, is going to be a fun show. Uh, we're talking about the first time you won the NWA world title before we get there though. I want to talk about what everybody else is speculating and all the buzz about this weekend. There's a rumor that stone cold. Steve Austin had such a good time at WrestleMania earlier this year. He's open to doing other stuff. This mm. has to be the right idea, the right opportunity. And I think you and I were both impressed with how well, they put together that match at uh, WrestleMania. I mean, told a great story. Fans were really excited and it, it framed Austin. Well, it highlighted what he can do really, really well. Sometimes when you see a guy who has a comeback match, maybe it's a little less than, but that was not the case with Austin. He had fun. He wants to do it again. So everybody naturally jumps to the assumption. Well, it's going to be another WrestleMania match. And that just created so much speculation. Of course, the internet has decided, well, they're definitely doing Roman and rock, even though nothing like that has been announced. You and I have debated, does that match need to be for the title? But that's not what we're talking about today. The question is what should Steve Austin do at WrestleMania? If he shows up, would you a put it with the rock? A lot of people like the idea of seeing that one last time. I could see that some other folks and including Dave Meltzer said the dream match is stone cold, Steve Austin versus John Cena. So fans of the attitude era versus fans of the ruthless aggression era, that could be kind of cool. It, it would be a more modern version of Austin Hogan. Maybe that could have happened in the late nineties or whatever, but then there's even another idea and I don't have any information on this. This is just internet speculation. Carry on. What if it was CM Punk? They teased that like 10 years ago when they were promoting a video game, when, when punk was on top. And of course, I don't know what his contractual status is, and you probably don't either, but the idea of Austin coming back and doing something else at WrestleMania is at least exciting to think about as a fan. Uh, if you had to put on your old booking hat, what would you do? Would you look to somebody like the rock double down on nostalgia, make the real dream match with John Cena or do something that fans thought they'd never see and go with punk or is there a deviation and you do something else? Cause you look at wrestling a lot different than we do. You know, Conrad, I had given this a lot of thought, but just as you were kind of walking through it, the thing that comes to my mind, and obviously I have a little inside baseball. Um, I was there, uh, this summer and, and heard some different stories and, you, you know, hearing the success of night one, it went so well, uh, him and KO, they invited him back for, for, for night two. 
And, you know, when I kind of pull back and look at kind of the entire landscape, and you probably could name some different guys, but Edge was supposed to be done. Nope, he comes back. I think there's a couple of folks, and I think there was a run of neck injuries and airing on the side of caution and publicly traded, and everything with that was, hey, man, uh, he's medical, uh, I think, sting to a lesser degree. Again, I don't know all the specifics of all these different guys, but I, I love the idea of Steve, uh, of Steve having another match. When I went out and did Broken Skull Sessions, uh, it was super fun, therapeutic. We had a blast. Uh, but it all kind of started WrestleMania night. Steve was backstage. Uh, me, Karen, and Cody were backstage. Uh, we went by. Uh, you know, Cody wanted to see my Cody. Uh, wanted to see Cody uh, Rhodes uh perform and we were there and it was catching up but me and steve chatted for i don't know three four five minutes and me and him took that picture together but that's kind of uh as we if you say reconnected but him training and it doesn't surprise me at all but as far as booking conrad all the options you kind of laid out my promoter mind my gut mind tells me you know I don't want to call them part-timer, but that's where they are. Cena or or whoever you named that does to me, doesn't resonate. KO versus stone cold was super entertaining and build for it was awesome. And coming out of that in KO's resume, but also when it comes time for him to be a part-time guy or whatever you want to say is a star to come back. I just think Steve, if I, if I was booking, I'd book him against a full-time roster guy and really figure out how to go into it. You know, on the buildup last year, I don't think there was an awful lot, but if Steve's no. in shape and he sh- shows up and I can assure you, Fox uh, SmackDown w- would love to have him on a couple episodes. Of course, raw would love to have him on a couple episodes, but building into WrestleMania season, if you've got rock uh, on, you know, whatever it may be, uh, raw, raw this week and stone cold on SmackDown and Brock and, and Roman. And then you just star shut it up. It, it, to me, it, it is brand awareness and stone cold is going to bring it, man. I I'm super excited personally for him, but I think all of professional wrestling, sports, entertainment legends, however you want to cache it, it just elevates the business. It just does. Because as my old friend Dutch Mantel says, you can't kill a memory. And everybody has that feeling inside of them when the glass breaks and the stunner happens. And, you know, the excitement in the stunner most of the time is in the three to five minutes build up where you go, Steve's stunning this guy before this promo's over. And you wait and you wait and you wait and it happens. So, uh, man, I'd have to look at that roster. And and really, but man, uh, KO one year, Sammy the next year, that could be interesting. That could be a lot of fun and a nice reward for Sammy after uh, wrestling a jackass star last year. And by the way, doing a great job. One of the most fun matches of the oh, year. Yeah. And you really want to talk about fun and getting fans excited. When that glass breaks, a lot of fans in the audience, man, they don't need blue chew. They're just going to, you know what I mean? That's right. This episode and all of our episodes are brought to you by blue chew. And guys, we all know confidence can take you far in life. And that's especially true in the bedroom. You know, when it's time to do what step up to the plate and that's where blue chew comes in. Jeff. And I think it's like a hot tag for your wiener. Blue chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as both Viagra and Cialis, but a chewable form and a fraction of the cost. You can take these daddies anytime day or night. So plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Now the process is simple. You'll sign up at bluechew.com. You'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, well, you'll receive your prescription within days. And here's the best part. It's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Let's use tablets made right here in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. It's going to be like a guitar shot to the dome. People are going to be talking about it. It's going to be stiff. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it. Have better sex, y'all. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code MyWorld at checkout. Just pay the $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. The promo code is MyWorld to receive your first month free. Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. And we thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. 
So Jeff, before we talk about you winning the NWA title, we should talk about current NWA. This past weekend, they presented the hard times three pay-per-view. It went down in uh, new Orleans, I believe. And, uh, friend of the show, Ricky Morton's son, Kerry Morton won his first title in wrestling. I believe he beat homicide. He's now the NWA junior heavyweight champion. Just thank the world to him and his family. And I think it's so cool that he has an NWA title. So congrats to him. Third generation. Yeah, man. But the, the thing everybody's talking about is what's going on behind the scenes. As we got ready to go towards the pay-per-view, it came out that Nick Aldis had given his notice. And once he gave his notice, the NWA suspended him. I guess they're still paying him, but said no need to come to the pay-per-view or the TV tapings. Your services are no longer needed. Mm. Now it's become a public pissing contest of sorts. I think Billy, Billy Corgan has done some interviews and, uh, stated his case. And of course, Nick Aldis went on our pal, Sam Roberts and, and just spilled his guts, if you will, let her rip and when it was all said and done at the end of the night at the pay-per-view, we had a new NWA world champion, Trevor Murdoch, who I think at this point had had two runs, dropped it in a three-way, uh, to Tyrus. Of course, Matt Cardona was in the ring as well. He had a hell of a run as the NWA champ reinvented himself and boy, it was met with a lot of criticism, lots of criticism online, especially given all the, the drama about you know, are there enough ladies in wrestling to do another empower pay-per-view and, you know, was Nick offended by this and was Mickey involved and should Billy have said that and all the, he said, she says, and you and I weren't really there for any of that. However, I did find a quote from, uh, our old pal. We like to call him our old pal, Billy Corgan. He went on Gerald Briscoe and JBL's podcast. It's called oh. stories with Briscoe and Bradshaw. Love those guys. So when did, when did he say this? This happened, uh, in advance of the, of the hard times pay-per-view. Okay. So before the, the, yeah, here's the exact quote. It's been transcribed that I'm reading it here. I call it the eight star Meltzer matches and all that stuff. And I like that stuff too. But if we're just talking business, just straight business, not fan stuff, I still believe in Brock Lesnar versus Bobby Lashley. And in this talking about the main event at the, his pay-per-view. You got Matt Cardona, who's recast himself on the independent scene as the star he is, check, versus Tyrus, who's, you know, six foot eight, 375 pounds, versus Trevor Murdoch, who's six three and another 350. I want to see that match. If you don't want to see stuff like that, don't watch the NWA, because that's what I'm going to give you. More and more of that as we climb. And I'm kind of able to develop younger talent in the mold of the NWA. We will be the toughest hardest hitting wrestling promotion in the world. I know there's strong style in Japan, but to me, that's a different psychological. It's hard to explain. I don't mean it disrespectfully. It's just a, a different psychology. I think we all agree on what he's trying to say there at the end, but what jumped off the page to me is comparing Brock Lesnar and Bobby Lashley, who are monsters who've main evented WrestleManias who have competed in MMA and comparing that to Tyrus and Trevor Murdoch and Matt Cardona, that, that feels like apples and pomegranates as Bruce would say. But the other thing that just jumped off to me as a business guy, if you don't want to see stuff like that, don't watch the NWA because that's what I'm going to give you more and more of that. I mean, listen, he's a hundred percent, right? This is his promotion. It's his money. He gets to do exactly what he wants, but I don't think that sentence and maybe it's not even a full sentence that part of a sentence out of context serves the company very well mm. but because i but i believe billy's like i know he has a vision for this thing we've talked about it i know he's trying to grow but to come out and say if you don't want to see stuff like that don't watch the nwa i don't think we've ever that's a new one on me You've done it all in wrestling. What say you? I have you? not done it all, but Conrad, <laughs> I just, as you were saying all this, I was curious to hear where you were going to go with it, but I, I literally had kind of visions of a few dressing rooms, a few car rides, the back seat with my grandmother, uh, being, uh, in, in the chairman VKM's office or hearing his comments. 
And so whether it's Jerry Lawler, no particular order, Jerry Lawler, Christine Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett, or Vince McMahon, they all said it in their own way. Obviously not exactly the same, but all said it in their own way. And they essentially would say that the best promoter or the best decision in promotion is listen to the people and give them what they want. Right. It, it, it doesn't get really any simpler than that. Now there's shades of that and different strategies of that and, 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 and going down that. But when you come out of the gate and alienate one fan, I don't get that. I, 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 I don't get that really under any circumstance. You, you, you've got to listen to the people and it doesn't ruffle Bob feathers. Like you were going, you know, comparing talent and I get it monsters and all that, but I'm going back to kind of the brawn mentality this day and age with YouTube and wrestling on five, six, seven nights a week as a promoter, you don't really give them what you like. You give, you give them what they want, right? That's black ink versus red ink to me. That's just that's entrepreneurship, salesmanship, you know, running a business is, and you know, we've talked about this before on the show. You, you try a lot of things and you do the things, the stuff that works well, you do more of that. And the stuff that doesn't work so well, well, we do less of that and ta-da, we become a better, more profitable, more efficient business. And, and you, you said this. Gosh, early in our uh, business relationship, uh, anyway, um, uh, I was having a conversation with one of your mortgage folks. I'll just say that. I'll, I'll say this and say, it's not no, it's not yet. Yes. But how, how do you, how, how do you, uh, our brother Blake says, but I heard uh, he was repeating what you said. Yeah. It's not no. But not yet. And here's how. Bingo. Because the reality is when people come to try to sell me advertising or whatever for the mortgage company, they always like to say, well, who's your target demo? <laughs> well, guys, I mean, I, like think about that from my perspective, my target demo is adult humans, <laughs> not even adult, because eventually you're going to turn 21 and or graduate college and get tired of paying rent and want to buy a house. And if you're a human, you could be my potential demo. Like everybody's got to have a place to live. So that's just easy. It, and Go ahead. I want to cut but, you. but this to me, the NWA is trying to serve a niche market. And I think when Billy says, and again, we're spending way too much time on this, but when he says, you know, the fan stuff he's referencing, okay, well, the guys who really like eight star Meltzer matches, that's a niche. Well, isn't it also a niche who watched the NWA and he might think, yes, but we're looking for a different niche. I think that's, I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying it's an interesting approach. Like I think Tony Khan gets criticized a lot for bringing in Japanese talent and international talent and making a lot of quote unquote cold matches. Uh, Bischoff says, oh, these guys are just wrestling for the sake of wrestling. Yeah. But a lot of his base in, in the AEW fans, they like to see good matches. So he's super serving that audience. And WWE, maybe they do tell more story, less matches. Well, AEW is the alternative to WWE. So let's flip the script. Let's do more matches, less stories. Now, people on both sides would argue with what I just said, but you get the idea. Yeah. AEW was born into the concept of we want to be an alternative for a for WWE. So my question is, is the NWA's goal to be an alternative from eight star matches? Because mission accomplished if it is, I think. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. oh, I, I, I and also as you were saying all that, we were me and you had that text uh, exchange. I don't know if it was Friday or Saturday. We're talking about, you know, we'll call it, instead of heels and babyface or good guys and bad guys, we'll go antagonists and protagonists. There you go. And it's it's like as as an antagonist. Hey guys, uh, breaking news alert! As Paul Heyman would say, spoiler alert! I'm not supposed to say things that you like. Yes. I, I guess what I'm supposed to offend you and you, you laughed and chuckled and I didn't really dumbass Jeff. I didn't really, it never clicked on me and you're like, Hey Jeff, they hate your guts. 
but we're going to have to do this. And this, I'm talking about May uh, of last year when we started the podcast. Yeah. These guys, I'm like, what? He goes, no, 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 no. They really hate you. I'm like, Conrad, no, Jeff, uh, let's kind of just walk through all this. You haven't really said anything for them to like. Yeah. In 25, years, in 25 years, I go, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> Well, because I think you were, and you even told me at the time, he goes, Conrad, you have to understand, like when I was wrestling, man, in the territory days or whatever, I'd come out the back of the building and the guys who were throwing trash at me and booing and flipping me off, they're doing all that inside the building during the show. But then when I come out the back of the building to get in my car, they're wanting pictures and autographs. (laughs) So it's like, they're part of, they understand. Yeah. But, but now we live in this, this internet age where, you know, the curtain's been pulled back a little bit and we know what it is and blah, blah, blah. So we have all these supposed quote unquote smart fans, me among them, by the way. But then we decide, well, I don't fucking like that guy. Why? Cause I just don't. <laughs> and, and I was that guy. I mean, damn, I used to go on something to wrestle and call you the human fast forward button. Well, that was kind of, you, you wanted me to hate you. Well, mission accomplished motherfucker. Uh, you did it. And then I met you in real life and I'm like, wow, this is not what I expected at all. And then you can see like, yeah, no kidding. He's a real person. And there's other people like that in wrestling right now, uh, who you and I both know who think of the world's biggest asshole and they could not be nicer people. Yeah. Uh, you'll find out the more you hang on wrestling. The bad guys are oftentimes the good guys and the good guys are sometimes the bad guys. But <laughs> I'm curious what's going to happen with the NWA. Uh, yeah. I'm pulling for Billy Corgan. I love the NWA brand. I know that he, he's one of the greatest rock stars of all time. I've never been cruising down the road, listening to lithium on Sirius XM and a smashing pumpkin song. Come on. and may not just stick to it to the end. So I don't want anybody to think that I don't like the smashing pumpkins or I don't like Billy Corgan or I don't like Pat or I don't love the NWA. I love Matt Cardona and Trevor Murdoch's a great guy. And I've never met Tyrus. I don't think maybe I did once in passing, but I am not somebody who's just totally down on the whole thing because I always lean into the, let's let it play out. Yes. Sometimes we see something we don't like. And I remember the July 2014 when people were so on fire for Brian, Daniel Bryan. And they wouldn't give it to us. And then when they finally did, it was like, this is the greatest thing ever. They made us wait for it. So I always just tend to say, well, let's just let it play out. But I I do wonder like who comes out and says, Hey, if you don't like that, don't watch. Well, shit. Okay. (laughs) By the way, if you don't like this show, tell me in the comments, what you don't like about it. And I'm going to try to work on that shit and do it better next week. Amen. I'm actively soliciting that, that, you know, feedback, please, by all means. We do it all the time on social and Conrad. Now we're going to get into the topic, but just pump the brakes. Uh, you, you were on vacation and, and doing all this, but our old pals over in Winston Salem, the annual tradition, Brian Hawks, Tracy Myers. I think this is year number nine or year number 10. Super successful. It is that weekend. I believe across the country and now kind Wrestle of Cade. say it, damn it. Wrestle oh, Cade. Okay. You damn marketer. Yeah, I should have got it out first, right? I was doing the build up. But anyway, WrestleCade weekend. I cannot wait. Me and the Queen are going to be over there. Um, we have a My World Live with some special guests being lined up. Going to have a blast. There it is. Uh, if you want to go the VIP route, admission, exclusive swag. Of course, a meet and greet with me and the Queen. But you're going to be the first to ask questions. And Conrad, as you've taught me, when we do what my world live, we tell stories that quite frankly, can't be told here on the podcast. It will not be recorded. It will not be posted. It's wrestlecade.com forward slash tickets. Uh, you'll see a bunch of opportunities there. You want to scroll down and look for Saturday, my world, Jeff Jarrett. You'll see two different options there. One for general admission, one for the VIP ticket. And don't you want to go ahead and get your picture made with the guy who ended Ric Flair and Sting's career. Inside of a handful of months. Well, this is your opportunity. I just, I just oh, go ahead. I cut you off. WrestleCade.com forward slash tickets. They started just 25 bucks. You're going to be there anyway. Uh, it's one of the biggest wrestling conventions. I've been three times, I think. Fantastic. Every time. Uh, I used to have to go to Charlotte for uh, Thanksgiving. 
now see uh my my daughter who used to be in charlotte well now she's in tuscaloosa so i don't have to go this year and as a result i won't be at wrestle k but almost everybody else is who's on our network whether it's eric bischoff or tony shivani or matt hardy or kurt angle it's a who's who uh, you can see them all but be sure to check out my world live with surprise guests WrestleK.com forward slash tickets. You were talking about my, what did you say I end Ric Flair's career? What, what, what was your line? And, you ended Ric Flair and Sting's career in a handful of months. Well, well I was going to say, but at WrestleK weekend, when you uh, were mentioning, I had uh, a match against Matt Hardy a few years ago. And busted his ass open, son. That that that, uh, that could have ended his career. <laughs> Jesus, I took his head off. Should have ended his career. Just phenomenal stuff. Let's talk about why we're here today. We filibustered enough. We're going to talk about the first time you won the NWA world title. And if you want to watch this and I encourage you to do so, you can do so at impactwrestling.com forward slash packages. You want to use the promo code Jeff that's impactwrestling.com forward slash packages. And the promo code is Jeff. And there's a lot going on here when you're going to win the world title. I think this is the 21st weekly pay-per-view. So just to remind everybody we're doing. Wednesday night pay-per-views here every single Wednesday for 10 bucks. Here's what the observer had to say. Five months in Conrad. We're only five months in. That's what's when I saw that it's TNA pay-per-view 21. That's God. We were still brand new. Felt like we'd been rolling a while, but five months in. It probably felt like an attorney on the one hand, it feels like, you know, man, things are flying. They're happening so fast. Where does the time go? But on the other hand, it's gotta be pretty stressful, dude. I mean, this is one thing to lay all this out on paper and you're excited, but now all the financial pressure that we've talked about, check it out in the archives, but man, it's just, you gotta be eat up with it, including personnel drama, like a no show from Sean Waltman. Meltzer had this to say the company heard nothing from Waltman all day and started getting worried about four hours before showtime. They checked and found that he never boarded his flight from LA to Nashville that left at 7 AM throughout the day. They called him, but he never called back just before the show went on the air. He finally called Jeff Jarrett and was very apologetic, said he'd overslept due to injuries and hadn't woken up until 4 30 PM Pacific time, which is 30 minutes before the show was to start. Waltman had suffered what appeared to be a serious back injury, taking a body slam on an independent date with Jerry Lawler in Connecticut on November 9th. The injury is severely inflamed SI joint in an MRI done earlier this week. Apparently the injury occurred because he landed differently in an attempt to overcompensate because of his hip injury. Even though he was in tremendous pain on the November 6th match with Brian Lawler on TNA, which is why it was kept short. He re-aggravated the hip when he slipped. I believe in the parking lot before the show and the hip went totally out. He apparently figured the 11, nine date was a spot show and he'd be working with Jerry Lawler, which is a match that isn't nearly as physically demanding as a pay-per-view match. And Waltman told friends afterwards that he was totally at fault and he felt like he had let down the wrestlers and the promotion with his behavior. I love me some Sean Waltman. I love most of all that when he messes up, he just comes out and owns it. I think that's some real man shit. And I appreciate that he called and told you this, but boy, as a guy who had been putting together TV and panicking, looking for the guy for hours and 30 minutes before we're supposed to go live, you find out not only is he not here, he ain't coming. This had to be stressful, but it's one of those things, man. Injuries are going to happen. How did you take this at the time? You know, I don't remember the specifics, but it, it it's no secret that, and I, again, that's what I'm saying. I don't remember the specifics, but five months in, a guy like Sean Waltman at the stage of his career, in a lot of ways, Conrad, we were just another booking. Here's a guy who's been on Mania or, you know, member of the NWO and member of uh, of DX and everything that goes with that. I mean, me and Sean, I mean, back, back. I mean, we, we, we go way back. But him calling, it just added to the stress. But again, another booking. And there were times in the early days that, you know, Sean – what I'll say this wasn't on his a game and was injured. And so the calling that late was a frustration, but it wasn't the only frustration that I was going through. Uh, as a matter of fact, as we get into this, we kept working with him and, and, and had him booked the following week or the following two weeks. But again, early days of TNA was such a juggling act of using uh, established stars, the up and comers, 
putting together a two hour show with the slim budget, but grateful to have that budget. It was, uh, it was challenging to say the least. I, that's, that's probably the easiest way to say it, but yeah, Sean's one of those guys that, uh, no BS around phone calls. Hey Jeff, this is a situation. I didn't get on my flight. A, B, C, D. I do. Thanks. I'll call you later. Meltzer would speculate that at the time, Waltman and Scott Hall are the second highest paid performers behind yourself. Uh, he would write that you guys were making, or you're making three grand a shot and they're making two grand a shot. When you're trying to cut costs and one of your top guys doesn't make it, do you feel the need to try to set a precedent and not let him get away with it? Because you don't necessarily want other, everybody else to do this, but you're also sympathetic and one of the boys and well, shit, I like this guy and he's, he's hurting. I mean, it's slippery slope for you here. Is it not? It is slippery, but it only, and it's always, I tried to tell guys that would come up and sometimes voice their concern in a professional manner. And sometimes in an unprofessional manner, I'd say, Hey man, this is a case by case basis. But at the end of the day, can you fault, <clears throat> can you fault me for trying to put out the very best show every week? No. We're, we're, we're in startup mode through and through dude. You kind of got to throw the emotional feelings aside and put out our best show every week. And look, it's, it's all me. If you know, shows a second time or a third time, but I got to do what I got to do. Well, let's talk about some other, uh, news and notes here. You're going to win a tournament to become the number one contender to Ron killings by defeating BG James, uh, the former road dog. And there's speculation that Vince Russo is, uh, gone, but not forgotten. It's written here. Russo is not at the show again. The idea of him eventually ending up with creative power is not dead. The belief is that he'll be the go-to guy if Panda believes Jarrett's methods aren't working. Jeff is still trying to get Russo and Jerry to work together, and Jeff has been trying to sell people in the idea that Russo understands how to get the mainstream audience that aren't wrestling fans into the product. And listen, I love that and appreciate that, but I am curious, if you don't have TV, how exactly is Russo going to get non-wrestling fans in the mainstream to check it out? Uh, I mean, so in the research, well, the short answer to that is it's, it's written that way, non-wrestling fans. Well, we'll call it water cooler talk or this fan will tell this fan, Hey, I was watching this. Hey, why don't you come watch this? Why don't you come watch a uh, puppet pull a gun on Jeff Jarrett? W whatever it may, whatever example you want to use. Is it hundred percent accurate? Of course not. But the theory behind, we don't have TV. So do we just cater uh, which I think is a misnomer. It's we got to put out the best product that's enjoyable that whoever's watching it, casual or non-casual, that comes back. And again, X Division catered to one audience, heavyweights casual to the casual fan. Uh, got to debut a new style of wrestling. I mean, all of the above. You, you got to go grocery shopping and and hope you're fixing the right meal. Uh, but it wasn't easy at all. And, and one of the things that's kind of a thread of this episode was that whether it was Dave Meltzer or Wade Keller or, or Jason Powell or whoever it may be, they're getting through their sources, different conversations. And obviously my dad is involved in that. I'm not saying, you know, he's not, but through all of that was that it, it kind of subliminally indicates that we were trying to hide some things for some folks and we just didn't air our business with everybody in the building. You just don't do that. So my best recollection, my dad, Vince Russo, myself, and a, maybe a core others, it's not like my dad went home for a week and then Vince was in. And then Vince went home a week and then my dad. It was never that set of circumstances. Did we all get along? Great. No. But there was never this, is Vince in? Is it Vince out? He just wasn't on TV. Russo wasn't known. Uh, and, and again, <clears throat> a Wednesday show. So he didn't drive up for Atlanta the week. What's what's it's not like he's on the outs just cause he wasn't in the building. Well, you know, there's certainly uh paranoia in wrestling getting there though. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Uh, we'll cover the, uh, end of the show as a whole. Um, but let's talk about some of the matches that we've got on this program. It's easy money and sunny Siaki beating divine storm, which is quiet storm and Chris divine with Trinity Meltzer would say, or Wade would say nonstop action 
typical TNA opener, but not especially polished. Uh, Easy Money and Sonny Siaki are starting to get built up. Uh, Divine Storm is a part of the the car ride from the Northeast with the SATs, I think. Who's helping find some of this independent talent for you in this era? JB, Jeremy Borash uh, would probably be at the top of the list, but also a lot of, I mean, I bet you AJ Styles brought me, I, I can't remember specifics, but four or five names. I mean, he would constantly bring different names. Uh, Jerry Lynn would bring different guys. Like I said, JB obviously was there, but there was a, there was a group of continuous, Hey man, give this guy a look, give that guy a look, give this guy a look, that, that type stuff. Let's, uh, let's talk about the money for a minute. Is it more cost effective for you to try to find talent who will drive in on their own dime? you know, quote unquote, paying their dues, hoping that you find someone that hits on and then they can, you know, get more consistent bookings and work their way up. Or what's the normal approach for how someone would get the exposure of being on a TNA show? Generally speaking, I think our weekly budget was about a hundred grand. Uh, and some people say, Oh, that wasn't much at all. And then other people say, Jesus, that's, ex-. but I, I'm saying all that to say that we had out of that, you know, television trucks and everything that go with it. We only had, I don't know, six, eight, 10 slots to buy airline flights that, that made sense. So guys went from, I'm not going to drive in to, yeah, I'll drive from Charlotte. Yeah. I'll drive from, I mean, the Canada crew drove from Detroit or Buffalo several times. That's a driving through the night. That's leaving on Tuesday morning and getting, you know, and, and people, as time went on, maybe not at this stage understood if I want to get on TV and I don't warrant a plane ticket, Hey man, I'm driving. And a lot of guys dug in and and did that. And I mean, you look at today, there's a lot of guys that, that, uh, will drive 10, eight, 10, 12 hours. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. So the use of the Indies, I guess, is sort of like your developmental system. Uh, Jim Mitchell is all over a lot of this show with the new church. Uh, he's going to make his final appearance in O2 for TNA. Uh, that was, uh, malice. Of course, Jerry toot. Am I saying that right? Toot, Jerry toot. Uh, he's been pushed heavily by TNA in the beginning, but now he's just winning squash matches. And then he just disappears after this show. Do you remember the circumstances behind him leaving? Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. So I don't want to go down a negative road, but maybe we need to. No, no. He, when he showed up to work at TNA, you know, he, he came ready, absolutely ready. Uh, wall, as I'd call him, I'd call him Jerry wall, or Jerry toot, or whatever. Uh, but no, he came ready and a hell of an effort, a hell of a guy, but there came a time again, going back to, he's not going to stay in the States for a, a Wednesday booking when he had a Japan deal and they were using him good over there. Um, and so it was just a, a matter of his availability. Uh, drastically was reduced. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, Ron and Don Harris. They're about to get their biggest push in TNA as the sex, the S E X storyline would unfold. Uh, this goes six minutes and the uh, Maximos get a little bit of offense here. Uh, the Spanish announce table, the SATs, uh, are not successful against the Harris <laughs> boys. six minutes and two seconds, but there's an interesting thing in here. Don Harris dives over the top rope onto the Maximos. Mike today is losing his freaking mind, uh, saying they're trying to beat the SATs at their own game. Of course, in the end, they win with a double power bomb. Wade gave it a star and a half, but man, that's interesting. Is it not like who would have thought, you know, I know that we say styles make fights, but the Harris boys and the SATs, that's, that's fun to watch. It's just a different matchup. And I know, you know, that wouldn't be what we would call if we're talking you know, independent or internet darling match, the Harris brothers versus the SATs. But again, I, I don't want to say innovative because it's, but, but a, a little bit different. And look, I knew Ron and Don, uh, literally day one, they broke into the business. Uh, I mean, 86, 87 in, in Tennessee, they came to the territory, but you know, their background, they're six, seven, um, college basketball players, twins that got, um, college scholarships to D one. And, uh, you know, like a lot of us, you know, they all definitely had their wild side, but you know, when you look at their runs in WCW or 
the WWF at the time and now TNA, um, they, you wouldn't look at them and say, oh, those are two absolutely great athletes. You just would never say that about them. But that that's why them diving over the top rope um, didn't surprise me at all. They're real. I mean, they're D1 athletes uh, and could hoop. Uh, I mean, they could play. So, uh, again, a little different. Uh, and then, you know, the, the lesser known stuff about that is, is their business brains. Uh, Mark Miller of Sawyer Brown, who was ran our music from day one. Both of those guys kind of grew up in the music business through his mentorship. And they both had backgrounds in merch and production and all kinds of stuff. So let's talk about something you and I both have backgrounds in and that's shitting the bed. Okay. Not really, but let me, let me ask you this. Did you know that traditional bed sheets can harbor more bacteria than a toilet seat? It can lead to acne, allergies, and stuffy noses, and it's just gross. Miracle Brand offers a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding like sheets, pillowcases, and comforters that prevent 99% of bacteria and require three times less laundry. How about this? These sheets are infused with natural silver that present not, prevent 99.9% .9 of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. No more gross odors. It's also this silver infused fabric. Well, it was originally developed by NASA. Well, these miracle brand sheets are now thermoregulating. What's that mean? It means they're designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. So you get better sleep every night. Miracle sheets are luxuriously comfortable without the high price tag of other luxury brands. And miracle sheets are the perfect gift for your spouse, your friends, or your family. Who doesn't want better sleep and luxurious feeling bed sheets? And since these come with three free towels, you get two gifts in one just in time for the holidays. So stop sleeping on bacteria. Clean sheets means less bacteria to clog your pores and fewer breakouts and other skin problems. So try miracle.com slash my world. That's where you need to go. That's try miracle.com slash my world. Try it today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40%. And be sure to use our promo code MyWorld at checkout to save even more and get three free towels. And Miracle is so confident in their products, it's backed with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not 100% satisfied, you'll get a free refund, full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Brand. Go to trymiracle.com slash MyWorld. Use the code MyWorld to claim your free three piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash MyWorld to treat yourself a friend or a loved one this holiday season. And we thank you miracle brand for sponsoring this episode and, uh, Sting's last match because it's happening this Saturday. What, what uh, a gift, what a gift we can uh, give to, uh, wives, girlfriends, in-laws, in-laws is the home run, man. Hey, self-cleaning, give them to the kids, <laughs> give them to these wrestlers who sometimes have leaky foreheads, you know, <laughs> Uh, Meltzer would say this, or I'm sorry, Wade would say this, your boy, Jerry, Jared isn't going to win promoter of the year, but he beats out the other Vince for father of the year. Right after the big power struggle, he gives his son the NWA title with all the bells and whistles he never used in previous title matches. And Jerry brought back his son's buddy. The first hour and 20 minutes of the show was awful. Booking the Harris brothers versus the SATs showed a complete lack of understanding of wrestling styles. <laughs> I understand the criticism, but I also know that sometimes we know what we want different shit, man. We want funny, interesting, unique for sure. And that's what we got here. I don't know. I don't hate it. They got to write their newsletters that they, they, they can't write boring editorial comment. They just it can't, can't just be everything. Oh, this was great. We'll be back after these words. Yeah. I mean, it just, it doesn't sell. It's boring to read. It's, it's, it's that simple. So the power struggle that is being referred to is between yourself and your father and Vince Russo. At this point, if you could take yourself back 21 episodes into this experiment, 21 weeks in, do you remember it getting better or worse? What getting better or worse? I want to make sure I answer your question. Well, your relationship with your father, the, the back and forth and what have you with, um, with Russo and your father. So. 
I mean, obviously I sit in the luxury seat today of hindsight, but I cannot say hindsight's 2020 because that's BS obviously in those days, but also it's just a part of growing up, maturing, not just a father son relationship, but as a wrestling executive, when I think about the decisions I made in the early days of TNA and and on the one hand, Conrad, hell, that's crazy. Put up my own personal money, a lot of it, and head off into this venture. Uh, no doubt about it, a higher power is guiding me. But things didn't get better, but I can't say they got worse between us because they were never as bad as everyone believes they were and written that way. But they were never really good. It's not like, but we all, you know, we we got along and tried to do what's very best. But I always said that uh, I go back to that conversation my father had, and he goes, "Look, one of us, we don't need to be fifty-fifty partners. We don't need to be fifty-fifty decision makers. A business doesn't work that way." So, what do you want? And I said, "I'm I'm the one who's leading this charge, so I'll take the lead on it." So, with that being said, I tried to make the very best decision and listen to Russo and listen to Jerry Jarrett and listen to others. And then I had to be the one that the, the, the buck stopped with me and make that decision. Again, it didn't get better. didn't get worse. It just was. AJ styles is out next with Mortimer plum tree. If you know is, go watch this. It's crazy to think that this is AJ's guy, but here he is. And they're going to take on, or he's going to take on, uh, Mr. Estrada and crimson dragon in a three way. This is to earn an X title shot the following week. AJ wins. It's called, uh, at times exciting, but mostly a disjointed mismatch of high spots. This is the finisher. It was especially good a star in three quarters. Crimson dragon is actually Chris Hamrick. Yes. We well, talk about a guy who was way ahead of his time. I mean, that guy in the more modern wrestling era, people would have loved him, but it does feel like he was just too early. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and he never had – God, Chris is super talented. Just in so many different ways because the uniqueness that he could take his bumps, but he never had the persona or the character and the push. But, man, um, <clears throat> you think about – this is kind of a uh, a good example of early TNA that AJ, and he'll tell you this to this day, in those early days, he wasn't a talker. He was developing his verbal skills. Mortimer Plumtree – worked in the office. There wasn't a job he was afraid of and, you know, Morty could talk. So we, you know, paired them up knowing that it wasn't going to be long, long term, but it worked for the night, but Jorge Estrada, he could go. And then Crimson Dragon put him under a mask and a persona and a character. But, um, you know, you made a comment the other day or just a second ago that either Dave or Wade said that it, it wasn't polished. Jesus, for for three years, nothing was really polished. I mean, it, it was startup. It it was what it was in, in every aspect uh, of the organization. Mortimer Plumtree, not a guy that we've spent a lot of time talking about. Um, <coughs> I don't know. Just seeing that. Yeah, right, just, just seeing him on camera next to AJ just tickles me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, this is an old school wrestling character. Fair to say. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Morty, me and Morty stay in contact today. Every now and then we'll exchange some emails. He lives up in Minnesota. Uh, but uh, again, kind of the people that contributed in these early days, Morty was kind of one of our promoters, if you will, locally. He was a guy that worked in the office and whether it was run errands or, I mean, he did a little bit of everything. He, he dove in head first in the startup organization. But I, when I looked at that photo and a AJ with the choker, that was classic AJ styles, early days, a choker around his neck, two earrings in, and what a youthful baby face look he had. <laughs> I loved it. And let, let me, let me give you that. to say the truth. If we had a sound bite of his promo, you would know it. Um, Meltzer would say they had a good crowd at the show, probably about a thousand. Mortimer Plumtree's taken over from Burt Prentice and handling the papering of the houses, and he's been far more effective at it. Apparently, they actually have people handing out tickets to people as opposed to leaving stacks at stores. We've not spent any time talking about how that piece of business works. Can you tell us about the old school way of papering houses and just leaving tickets at stores? I mean, 
I, th that doesn't work. It, it, there is, it, papering houses can be done a number of different ways. And I think everything under the sun has been tried, but, but at the end of the day, you know, getting into the community, Nashville for years and years and years, wrestling was on Saturday nights. So educating the folks, you can't buy enough radio or television advertising in 2002 to educate the people. That was only word of mouth. You know, Nashville in the city is, is today, but still a, a major metropolitan city. So you had to go into areas and whether it's convenience stores, you know, we talked to boys and girls clubs. We talked to schools. We talked to, you know, grocery stores, going in and physically meeting people. If you leave a stack of tickets on a, on a, on a counter, a checkout counter, that, that's, you might as well just throw them in the trash. So Bert didn't quit doing it. Uh, we added, we'll call it Mortimer to the team mm -hmm. and said, Hey man, you got a couple hours, you know, every afternoon when, whether it's in the morning when people are going to work or it's afternoon, they're getting off. That's when the convenience stores, that's when the grocery stores, that's when the high traffic is, go out in that South Nashville area and let people know. And it worked. We had to get the people in the habit of coming on Wednesday nights. Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here. And just want to call a quick timeout. I want to tell your listeners about what I've been telling everybody at over at 83 weeks, quite a while now about all the cool things that are happening over at freeshows.com. Boy, have we got a treat for you guys today. It's something we're calling the book. And today we're going to examine the actual handwritten notes from Mr. Fritz von Eric. These are essentially day planners that have his real name on the outside. And it's his handwriting every day of the month uh, for the entire year of 1982. And, and that's what we're going to be working through. And everything. that's not all. Conrad sits down with former WWE writer and CEO of Major League Wrestling, Court Bauer, as he discusses his time in WWE, what he's doing now, and some never before heard stories about Vince McMahon. Are, are you saying that you actually pitched Vince McMahon an exploding death match and he was on board with it once upon a time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everyone in the room will back that up. It was, it was, it was such a cool sacrifice. I, I think it was, Maybe it was the IWA one. And if you're looking for an interactive experience, our top guy sat down with WWE Hall of Famer Jake the Snake Roberts as he answered their question. And you know, all the other whoever's watching that Jake Roberts would drop you that DDT and you wouldn't get up. So all you're doing is telling the fans you're not as good as I am. That's just a small taste of what we've got waiting for you with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why ad free shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. So listen, we got a lot to talk about. Let's talk about some of the news and notes with uh, AJ styles. Uh, it's in the observer that he's pushing for Christopher Daniels to be brought back in as a regular. And this just jumped off the page to me in my research quote, Jared, for some reason is not high on Daniels. Although the reason he hasn't been around more is due to his Japanese commitments. Is that true? You weren't high on Daniels. What's the, uh, what's the issue there? And uh, definitely high on Chris, but what, what was weird was a, uh, not a regular. I don't even remember a time when Chris wasn't a regular. Now look, it would ebb and flow. And Chris is, uh, I'll say this diplomatically. He's older than uh, AJ Styles. Uh, yes, they're buddies, but a lot of people, Chris had been around a while and he had not just your band commitments, but Chris worked regularly. And so we were a Wednesday booking for him, but one, uh, you know, one out of the seven days. So, uh, no, but again, newsletter writing always high on Chris and, uh, you know, Chris worked with us. I mean, he, I, I got a picture in my office and, uh, the TNA originals and, and you can just kind of look, look at the the roster, if you will. And he's sitting on the top rope and there's Eric young, there's abyss, there's Chris Daniels, there's Shane and AJ and Bobby and James and amazing red. And you go through the list, but he he's one of the, the originals. Next up, we got Brian Lee on this pay-per-view teaming with slash to take on Chris Harris and James storm. Whatever happened to those guys? Uh, they go 10 minutes, 53 seconds. Uh, there's a DQ win here for Brian Lee and uh, slash to retain the NWA tag titles. Storm has grabbed a spike from Lee uses it. The ref sees it DQs him. Another good match. Meltzer would say, or Wade would say good intensity and a sense of rivalry. Two and a quarter stars, the new church slash Brian Lee, this America's most wanted 
these are staples of early TNA and good stuff, right? And this, the, James Mitchell and the New Church and Brian Lee, people know his most famous run would be the Fake Undertaker in SummerSlam. What was that? Ninety four. Ninety four. Okay, I was going to say ninety five, but no, it just just you know, Brian is. Uh, I call him a kid, but he's a, a, a talent from Florida that worked in the USWA, uh, many, many different runs. And then as I just referred to, he was in the disciples of apocalypse and the fate undertaker, but in TNA, the new church, he knew him and Wolfie were a hell of a team. And yes, they were a staple, but those two young boys, Chris Harris, James storm, the beginning of kind of their run that, you know, they weren't America's most wanted, but, um, Things were getting off and running, and those guys knew how to work a pay-per-view style tag match with a lot of intensity, and that crowd ate it up. Let me just say that that kid, Brian Lee, is actually older than you. No way. Yeah. He was born in 67. Damn. He's got a birthday coming up uh, here next week. He'll be, uh, he'll be 56. Maybe you can give him his last match, too. I think he's got a forehead that needs a guitar on it. Just do one at a time, pal. We got Saturday. Collect them all like Pokemon. <laughs> well, I've got to talk to Coz. Go Pokemon hunting. <laughs> I think you found one. I mean, Darby Allen looks like a Pokemon. Sting too. Oh, and they're going to get a peek at you and the inside of a guitar this Saturday. Oh, they Darby wore that guitar. Nice. I know you don't know what Pikachu is, but I just got props from Eric Rotten Christ there. Next up, we got Jerry Lynn wrestling Amazing Red. Guys. T and A in this era, so underrated. I mean, Brian Slash, Brian Lee and Slash against America's Most Wanted. That's fun. But this is like X Division gold. Literally, it's for the X Division title. Jerry Lynn retains. Meltzer would say it was great action for 10 minutes. Red's gonna be very good for a very long time. Three and a half stars. He, Man, cursed, he cursed him. What could have been, right? Like you talk about a guy who revolutionary in a lot of ways. And, you know, people, God, I, I can't say enough about red one, this match, you've got the player coach, yep. he, even in those days, Jerry Lynn just knows how to be the glue, the foundation, the base, uh, but super skilled at putting everything together and making it make wrestling logic and wrestling sense. It, it was, it was fantastic. And, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, if red was a foot taller or if red was 30 pounds heavier, and I would always say, why are you saying that? Yeah. You know, why, what makes red special is exactly that. You, I mean, can you, I don't think Ray Mysterio would have ascended to his heights had he been six inches taller and, and 40 pounds heavier. I, just, I would even say if he started at his WWE weight, it wouldn't have been as impressive. A bingo. He, I agree. It, it was the underdog story. You were getting behind the guy and telling these David and Goliath stories with a guy who was like a real life Spider-Man and Spider-Man, in case you aren't familiar, isn't the same size as the incredible Hulk. They have to be different sizes. Yeah. And, and that's amazing. Red. I mean, yeah. I'll never forget the night in Nashville that people kind of thought it was silly, but dad, my father, Jerry Jarrett is screaming at Don West in a nice way. Don stand up and cheer for red. Okay. And he starts chanting up. Then he said, stand up on the, the announce table. Like what? Uh, but you know, Don being the fan's voice, my father was emotionally feeling how can you not like this guy, David and Goliath? And he's trying his ass off and red could sell. And Dan, Don got up on that table and started cheering for him. I mean, the people said, we're watching something special. I'm buying in. I'm going to be emotionally invested in this. That was red. He would get people emotionally invested in his matches quickly. The, uh, the next thing we should discuss here is a line from your boy, Wade Keller. Oh boy. I still see no indication of anything that makes me think this promotion has a chance <laughs> over 20, over 20 years old now. This has a little more than a chance. Maybe just eight. So you're saying there's a chance. Yes, sir. Yeah. But again, it goes back to the narrative and you can hear the narrative in so many different things, but now we, not to not to take a sidebar, but you know, back in those days, this narrative was kind of long running. Nowadays, the narrative changes every two or three weeks in wrestling. One minute WWE, the, everybody's on this, and now then it's AEW, and 
kind of now over this weekend, it'll be NWA and then it's going to be new Japan. And then, you know, when, when you start revealing what we're working on behind the scenes that we can't talk about, but you know, it's coming Conrad, then that narrative is going to break in. Right. <laughs> Conrad, I'm trying to make you smile over there. Roll tide. Roll tide. Let's talk about the start of the show. We, uh, we opened this pay-per-view. We said, we'd come back to it with a, a package about the NWA title match. And that's where they do a sit down interview with Mike Tanay and the truth, Ron Killings about his title defense. And he basically says it's going to boil down to who wants it more. Mike Tanay was so good in these segments. I wish we could have seen more of that. I think there's a place for it even today in wrestling. And I just, man, I wish Mike Tanay could have fun in wrestling and be a part of wrestling in 2022. Don't you? Conrad, I cannot tell you how many times me and Mike would have these different conversations and look, I'm not going to say that there wasn't contributors uh, amongst the creative team, but it goes without saying Russo liked to do things a hundred and maybe 110% of, but it's, that's really not mathematically possible, but let's just say hundred percent entertainment in vain. My father wanted to do it in wrestling vein. Me and Mike would have these conversations and, and basically the whole gist of the conversation, let's treat this in a wrestling world as much as we can, like a sport and Mike being not just a UFC fan, but a, I mean, he knows all kinds of sports and he knows all kinds of lines and whether it's basketball, football, baseball, hockey, you name it, me and him could talk sports throw day DW in the mix. And it would be a, a, a marathon conversation about whatever's going on, but Mike's ability to sit down and be an Al Michaels to be, you, you name it, a Bob Ryan, whatever sports caster you're favorite of that would might knew how to sit down in a wrestling setting, which is first and foremost, but give it the sports flavor and kind of do the story behind the story. Um, and it come off so real. Uh, I saw him have an interview with, with Conan and Conan's as real as it can get too. And it, 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 it left me going, how do we kind of capture more and more of that in, in bites? Again, we didn't have the post-production facility, but my, I can't say enough good things because he treated it like, you know, the mindset that we both had treat it like a sport specifically in this segment. I want to talk about promos here for a minute. I was at a, an event years ago, maybe almost 10 years ago it was before SummerSlam in LA. And they did a little, I don't know. You might call it like a, I don't know, a panel discussion. Yep. And I saw triple H on the panel and he was saying, you know, you guys, I see online, a lot of you guys hate scripted promos who hate scripted promos. Yay. And you guys want to go back to the way it used to be, right? Yay. Well, do you know that some of your favorite promos had those promos scripted in reality? You just want good promos. You don't want, you don't care really if it's scripted or not scripted. You want good promos, but the trouble is back in the day, you had all of these tapes that you had to do the pre-tapes where you would do spot show, you know, this Saturday night in Evansville, whatever, you don't, they don't have that now. So he was sort of laying out. The challenge is, do you have the talent start doing that when they're not very good at it, but allow them the reps to get better or is the audience going to shit on it because it's not awesome right away. So you try to support them with scripting. And I get that. That was the first time it was really explained that way. And I got it. I say all that to say, I watched this promo with Ron earlier today. Not very good. Now, Ron, these days, a lot better. Obviously the repetitions there, but it is as a guy who's sort of steering the ship, you got to pick one, right? Do we need to heavily script this guy up and prop him up as, as Heyman might say, accentuate the positives, hide the negatives, or do we just let him get the reps and get better and get more comfortable? Because it is something that you just got to do more often, right? Jeff reps, nothing replaces experience specifically in professional wrestling in delivering a promo. It's one thing to deliver memorized lines and you can have the exact same talent and you can send him away and say, 
here's three bullet points that I want you to hit. Yeah. So hypothetically speaking, I want you to give me three bullet points. I'm going to give you three bullet points and you come back with a promo, or I'm going to give you a script and come back with a promo. Uh, and, and they can, that same talent can come to you and deliver it. And they're going to be a little bit different flavor, or you walk up to a seasoned vet like Jerry Lawler or Austin Idol or John Cena. And, and you have to have, if you just say, Jerry, go, your opponent is this. That promo is going to be better because they're seasoned. It's what they do. They know how to craft words. They know how to communicate. Nothing replaces that. That's why I urge guys so often today when you're not out working independent shows and, oh, bro, you're going to pick up bad habits. What? No, go learn and come back and I mean, nothing replaces reps in the ring. Nothing replaces reps on the mic, period. TNA days, we had to kind of get up and swing for the fences and do promos and matches, and none of it was real polished, if you will. But it was what it was. I'm glad that you watched it, Conrad, because when I watched it back, I just think to myself, there was a guy, Ron, who, you know, had a quick little cup of coffee at the WWE and then right. Ron was driving from Charlotte to Nashville every week. He wanted to learn. Look at him now, 30 year career, 25 year career, whatever it may be. But yep. Even Ron, the truth killings wasn't polished. Uh, there was a day that he wasn't polished. And by the way, that's not a bad thing. I mean, you're seeing guys, you know, do stuff really for the first time. I mean, at this point in his career, Ron Killings probably hasn't had a sit down interview like this. So he's, he's got to get comfortable. Let's talk about the, uh, the match itself. Well, before we get there, there's a Jeff Jarrett video package that airs that, uh, everybody said was very well produced. Who was putting together? I know you said we didn't have a big production facility and blah, blah, blah. Who was responsible for putting together video packages and tales of the tape and all that sort of stuff. And look, we both uh, admire Jeremy Borash. Yes. But JB, a radio background, if you will, literally a radio background, WCW live experience. So what real experience did he have about editing? You talk about the early days of TNA. Hey, I'm going to give it a shot. This is early JB work. Wow. It's, it's, uh, yeah, we're five months in, six months in, but JB sitting down on a, I mean, I would sit there sometimes beside him or in the room with him and he's putting it together and wow. Okay. He put together a package. So yeah, early, early days of TNA. Let me just mention too, and we don't give JB enough of his flowers on this program. You said it exactly right. This is a guy who was doing radio and doing well from Minnesota Marconi award winning and, and does well win some radio awards. But again, Anybody who's listening to this, who's been in radio or been around it knows that not a ton of money in radio. Nope. Humble beginnings, you know, young guy, so young, he might've even still been living with his parents. I don't recall, but he gets an opportunity to go work for WCW and gets paid all of a sudden, like more, even than his old man, life-changing money for a young cat in radio to have this opportunity. And then very quickly, he sees WCW tries, he might, you know. What can he do? He goes out of business. So what does he do? He says, I'm going to try to learn how to do everything. So he went from just being a radio guy to just hosting a podcast to learning how to be an in-ring announcer to learning how to help put together booking sheets and back timing and editing video. And he is a true success story in wrestling. In my opinion of a guy who went out and figured it out. And a lot of times I get messages from people who say, man, I want to start a podcast. What do I do? And I always say the same thing, Jeff. I always say, just start doing stuff. Never talked to Jeremy about that, but I bet Jeremy would give the same advice. Just start doing stuff. You'll get better. It's the old thing. Oh God, I hate this. And this is me coming from the 36 years now, but you know, he never took a bump. You're right. He sure didn't. Who gives a shit? Yeah. Jeremy is a self-starter. Yes. He is a contributor. And that, that's what I wanted to say here is if, the most organized cat, but look, we all got our strong suits. That's a gig on him, but no, but, but yeah, no, a self-starter that that's the deal. Take the initiative, pick the ball up and, and 
God, these early days of TNA, Mortimer Plumtree, he drove down from Minnesota and said, I'm here to work. I, I mean, Rudy Charles, same thing. I'm going to answer phones. I'm going to referee. Hey, I can uh, type pretty good, Jeff. This word doc over here. Yep, Rudy, sign you up. Come on in. I mean, you know, he, he's format after format. After, it's, it's story after story after that. And I, I've seen some guys backstage in AEW that I think have that same mentality. Yes, they it, love it. They want to be involved and they're willing to learn how to do it all. Do it all. That's longevity, friends. Uh, just can't recommend it enough. Maybe you don't have an aspiration to get into the wrestling business, but if you learn how to do everything at your job, you're going to be in a pretty good place. Yep. Uh, something I want to mention that, uh, we should all try to learn how to be good at is saving a little money. And I got to tell you, I discovered something that I'm going to brag about here because at the start of the pandemic, boy, my wife and I signed up for literally every streaming service we could get our hands on. Guess how many of those we watch now? Almost none. And I didn't real, realize how bad it was until I found out about true bill. A true bill these days is known as rocket money. Are you wasting money on subscriptions? Well, it turns out 80% of people have subscriptions. They forgot about maybe it's an unused prime account for you, or maybe a Hulu account that never gets streamed. Well, there's a great app that I use now to help me track all of my expenses. And because of it, I no longer waste money on subscriptions. I don't even use. You might've heard of it. It's called rocket money. I first discovered it when it was true bill, but what was really cool to me is I think most folks think they spend like 80 bucks a month on subscriptions, dude, it's closer to $200 or more, which means you could be wasting hundreds of dollars a month and you don't even know it. See the app shows you all of your subscriptions in one place, and then it cancels for you, whatever you don't still want rocket money can even find subscriptions. You didn't know you were paying for. You may even find out you've been double charged for a subscription. Now that happened to me. My wife signed up for a service. So did I, we both thought we put it on the Apple TV. Turns out we had two accounts. We only needed one to cancel a subscription. All you have to do is press cancel rocket money takes care of the rest. So get rid of useless subscriptions with rocket money. Now go to rocketmoney.com slash my world. Seriously. It could save you hundreds per year. That's rocketmoney.com slash my world. Cancel your unnecessary subscriptions right now at rocketmoney.com slash my world. Now with that in mind, let's get into the match. Here we are. You're going to win your first NWA world title from Ron killings here. You go 17 minutes and 36 seconds. And the torch had this to say, both men worked their tails off to make this as good as possible, but having not worked together before, it wasn't as smooth as it needed to be. They wrestled mostly in the ring, but also had a ringside brawl. Jarrett bled heavily. In the end, the ref went down. Then Mr. Wrestling three entered the ring and bashed Jarrett's guitar over truth's head. Jarrett fell on top of truth and got the win a very good match in many ways, but not always convincing. It seemed a bit forced at the time. So just off the top of your head, what do you remember about this match this night, this moment? Because even if you are running the promotion and I know that titles are, you know, some people would say, and Jim Ross even says they're props, Conrad to tell stories. I get it. But still as a guy who grew up an old school wrestling fan to have that 10 pounds of gold and to know in your rear view, the big gold belt. Those two belts were synonymous, at least in mine and your lifetime of NWA wrestling. And now you've held sort of both iterations of that. Is it a cool moment or are you more concerned with all the other business stuff and you don't really get to soak it in, if you will? So your question was, what do I remember about it? Yeah. I mean, were you able to enjoy it or is it just another day at the office? So uh, on your line about, uh, belts or props and JR and, and well, he's not the only one. All, uh, lots of folks say that my, I don't even want to call it a counter, but my follow-up to that, that I've always said, and I bet I've said this to Russo or the creative room many times, guys, it may be a prop, but it is in our story. It is the prop. A guitar is a prop, a chair is a prop, um, a tag tail, you know, prop, 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 prop. But it, 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 in our sports entertainment, professional wrestling, fictional world, it's the prop. So you got to have that mindset in everything we do, whether you wear it, 
to the top, you know, wear it to the ring or the referee holds it uh, the way they hold it. I just think every little nuance I believe is important. Um, and, and so, yes. So did I get to stop and smell the roses? Zero chance. Yeah. Kind of, there was just so much on me, but I will say that, that as time has gone on and I think about the match and I do remember and watching it back, the people were really with it. The, the people know it's the NWA world title and, and, you know, so we're five months in six months in. So we're, you know, whatever it is, 20, 25 shows and we're, we're getting a groove in Nashville and the people are coming out the episodic storytelling <clears throat> because the people were on fire and into it. Was it a perfect match? No, but I'll just say they were into it. So when the fans get into it and me and Ron were into it and the story, everything, you can't help but not get into the moment. And, and I think that's one of the things that, you know, even Karen to this day, we're like, you know, Jay lethal said it, uh, a, a day or two after Rip Flair's last match and like, dude, you just kind of flipped the switch. And I go, ah, it comes with time. If you don't really get into that moment, and 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 get into whether you want to call it playing the part, or whatever it may be. I mean, there's a guy in the AAW crowd week one when I was leaving the ring. He, he just kind of looked at me, and and I had eye contact back with him and all this, and he just kind of went and looked up at me, kind of ran, like, "Oh man, I'm sorry." And I'm just like, "You got to get into the moment." And so yeah, yeah. I was into the moment here. Um, so sure, it is the title that. Jack Briscoe, Harley Race, Dory Funk Jr., my dad's favorite champion, the 10 pounds of gold, obviously F Flair and Dusty and everybody, every champion that goes with it. Of course, it's special. It was super special to me. And how it came together and my father and Russo and the story, it's funny to look back how ironic, but maybe not ironic, how me uh, winning my first NWA title, the circumstances, I'll say that. Well, let's get into those circumstances. We mentioned Mr. Wrestling number three, and I'm sure some of you are thinking, wait, who? Johnny Walker. Nope. Maybe not him. <laughs> uh, this is directly from the torch. Ron killing still, is, still isn't as smooth as he needs to be in telling a story in the ring in order to be taken seriously and become a draw. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. I understand that he's on the way up, but I think. I don't know. Sometimes I feel like you got to have a little patience. I say this a lot to my dad as he's flipping out on Saturdays when Alabama has a less than awesome play. I'm like, yeah, dad, you know, that guy was, he went to prom like six months ago, right? Like he's had a driver's license for two years. Like, let's calm down. Let's, let's, kids. let's let him get some reps. They're kids. I think the same thing about, you know, we're comparing Ron Killings who still don't get me wrong. Uh, he's, he's not a spring chicken, but he does not have the prime time wrestling experience that you do. So you're going to see a difference when y'all are in there together and to jump on him and say, Oh, he's not ready for this. How the fuck does he get ready? You know, it's sort of like when you're looking for a job and on the job say, well, we got to have two years experience. Well, how do you get experience? You got to start and, and be less than before you can be better than, um, anyway, Here's the Mr. Wrestling three piece of business. Just when I was wishing that Mr. Wrestling three would hit himself with the guitar <laughs> instead of Jeff Jarrett or Ron Killings, TNA pulled off its first worthwhile surprise in the form of Vince Russo. Make no mistake about it. I have not been a fan of Russo's booking since he left WWE, but there's no denying that the guy made a good on air talent in WCW. Sure. He was overexposed in his short run there. But that shouldn't be a problem as long as Jerry Jarrett has the book. Still not sold on Russo? Well, despite the fact that they haven't had a website for a couple weeks now, TNA is primarily a web-driven business, and no one gets internet wrestling. Jarrett hasn't wrestled very often lately, and it's obvious since his timing in the ring isn't anywhere near where it was a couple of years ago. So I got to tell you, of all the things I thought Wade was going to be critical of as I sat down to see what everybody thought of this show. I never expected to hear the phrase TNA pulled off its wor first worthwhile surprise in the form of Vince Russo. Okay. I thought everybody was just unanimously negative about Russo. It made me happy that, oh, okay. It's not all negative for once. How about that? Well, a good writer will go left when his audience thinks he's going right. Oh, right. that's a surprise. Wait. Hey, I want to 
I like, let me buy into it. It's kind of the nature of the beast. Uh, Wait, now, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that? I don't mean to cut you off. But I just want to make sure I'm, I'm following here. You really think the move is swerve city. That's the way to get them. That's what wrestling fans really want are swerves. Oh, I don't, I didn't say wrestling fans. I, I believe there's an innate mindset in reporting bad news sales, right? Controversial sales, as our friend says, um, the, the going against the grain sales. If you just say, Hey, that's great. Jared had a great promo. What a great debut, man. He's 55 and, uh, it is so good to see him on my TV and I have enjoyed every match of his entire career. And, you know, he did Ric Flair solid and him and Conrad make a good team. And, you know, this rah, rah, shish, boom, ba. Okay. Next page. It right. just, it, it, there's, so, so I'm not saying wrestling fans want to swerve city, but controversy and, and pick a point out. And when my audience thinks I'm going to say this, I think Dave Meltzer's made a fortune off just that. I mean, yes, statistics and numbers and, and everything that goes with it. But, but he, you look at him on Twitter. He, he will light folks up just to create the conversation, I believe. And does a good job at it. Meltzer liked the match too. He says largely to do with Jarrett's interviews, both on the show last week and on local TV. They were talking about the value of the NWA historically and for him growing and this being his lifelong dream. The crowd was really into the title as the real deal. And the two had a hell of a match, largely with Jarrett carrying killings. And he gave it three and a half stars. He says there were disagreements about the finish. Some felt that Jarrett should win clean because it would have been a fitting end for the kind of match the crowd wanted to see. Even though Jarrett has been a heel from day one, the crowd's probably behind him more than any wrestler on the show thus far. He worked the match as the baby face and they introduced him as being from nearby Hendersonville, Tennessee. They did the old school boxing style ring introduction and that added to the atmosphere of the match. It's funny because it's the little things like that and differentiating the world title match that make it different from every other match on the show. And that makes it special. Jared even did the Fargo strut early to establish him as the face. It was also the best job Jared had done in the ring as he was able to work it as a serious NWA title match while carrying killings who isn't of that caliber yet. None of killings prior NWA title bouts, or for that matter, Ken Shamrocks had the crowd really taking it as anything other than one of a million indie titles. The crowd was on its feet with an intensity not seen in the promotion for the last several minutes and lived and died with the near fall when killings kicked out of the stroke. Jerry Jarrett was strong on the Russo finish. Most internally believe the two are back working together. Even though everyone in the company is being told by management that Russo is on air talent and nothing more. There's a reason to spread this. If it's not true, that's because many key people have heat with Russo. They're probably figuring out that when McMahon bought Bischoff in as talent, but not creative, even the people who hated Bischoff it was no morale problem because they recognize used correctly. Bischoff could be an effective character. I find the analogy interesting, Jeff, that maybe people were hesitant to like his ideas and to be on board with his ideas, but if he's just going to be on camera, well, that could work. And, and the idea that the person we're comparing it to is the very recent circumstance where Eric Bischoff comes to works for WWE. Do you remember feeling like, all right, we got to just get this out here that he's just talent or is this just rumor and innuendo? I can't say it's rumor and innuendo, but I always was of the mindset that it's semantics, right? Does anybody think that I'm not? I mean, AJ Styles is a young guy, and I would ask him on his, on his segment, yes, the old, well, what do you think about A, B, and C in your segment? So the same is going to go true for Russo or the new church or, you know, I mean, you can't ask everybody's opinion and, and get their input or, or you have a, a bad-tasting show when when there, there's no clear-cut vision. But, of course, so I don't remember, the, like, hey, guys, let's huddle. Rick Russo's just a talent. Let's just kind of see them. Let the people observe that and, and, and understand that not 
try to get up on our soapbox and make that big announcement. Just fascinating stuff here uh, to beat up and discuss. Um, and we'll get in later episodes, Conrad, because, you know, Dixie and Vince went through that whole secretive thing. He's not a part of the show, and that blew up. So right. He, yeah. Uh, anyway, I don't want to. We're going right. to get there eventually. We're still yeah. 21 weeks in. Yeah, uh, but I was just trying to counterbalance the whole. It becomes a thing, though. I mean, you're exactly right. Like, that's a theme that we hear over and over. Uh, here's some more from Dave about Russo's reappearance in the company. This led to internal fireworks, which resulted in Sean Waltman quitting the promotion and leaving the status of Scott Hall in question. Waltman quit on November 26 over Russo being brought back. Although he was told that Russo had no hand in creative, he didn't believe it and has lost trust with the company. Let's stop right there. Seems to be something we're going to talk about a lot. You sort of referenced the infamous Mike Johnson email. He was sent by accident when uh, I guess Russo thought he was sending it to Mike today and it went to Mike Johnson from PW Insider instead. Anyway, what was Waltman's issue? Do you remember this? Him saying, Jeff, if he's there, I can't come back. Well, I'm trying to, I mean, I recall there was chatter, but, and I don't even know if you know this Conrad, but do you know that Sean Waltman and my father were tight going back years and years? I mean, the one, two, three kid days, Waltman was an ally of Jerry Jarrett. Yes. Through and through. So it could have been more of a perception on Sean's part that, Hey, I'm, I'm voting Jerry Jarrett and I don't give a crap. I'm going to let it be known. Same with Scott Hall, Scott Hall, when my dad and him worked together at WWF and obviously the early uh, Tennessee days that, you know, he was a fan of machismo and loved the character and everything. So um, both of those guys maybe were casting their vote, so to speak. Um, and, and again, Vince, whether it was China and I'm not saying it was, you know, I, I don't know what Sean's specific, um, issue was yeah. W w with Vince, but they were there for sure. It's just fascinating to me that, you know, this guy's this polarizing, but yet a guy like Jerry Jarrett, he's all about it. Um, here's something else from the observer. In addition, they were hopeful that Joni Lauer would be able to come in because it's felt that she has the ability to garner mainstream publicity with none of the other wrestlers that the company can. Waltman blew up over the Russo angle because he didn't like the idea of a company that works its own wrestlers on angles. And because of his hatred of Russo's philosophy of wrestling, he didn't believe that Russo was only talent, which is the prevailing viewpoint among many in the company, despite the constant denials from management. Waltman had gone to bat for Jarrett with the Panda people in his battle with Russo, noting to them he wouldn't be a part of the company if Russo was giving creative power. When he was asked if Russo was still with the company, he was never outright told no, but was told he had no part of creative and felt double crossed when he heard about the angle on the 20th. Do you remember a sit down with Waltman and Panda? No, but, but uh, again, Dixie to her credit, wanted to get to know talent as well as educate herself on as many opinions as possible. So Dixie and Waltman, I'm sure had multiple conversations. So the original plan was to, uh, well, before we talk about that, what was going on with China here? Were you in conversation with her or was somebody else handling that? I believe that was. Man, I think in the early days, I, I wasn't in conversations. Russo, maybe, but I kind of feel it would have been through Waltman. I don't know where their relationship was at the time. I don't recall. Meltzer would say the original plan was to put Henning and Hall, who were the AWA tag champs back in the 80s, back together and put them over for the belts. When Hall couldn't appear on the show, Waltman was booked into the spot and there was serious talk of putting the belts on them perhaps partially to pacify Waltman, who had expressed his unhappiness vocally many times. Waltman refused the match, saying the match he owed them was a match with Jarrett, and he wanted to put Jarrett over clean in an NWA title match on his last night in. Is that the way you remember this? It, 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 all this kind of runs together because Kurt was in and out, Scott was in and out, Waltman was in and out. There was drama over the Russo thing, but as far as sort of clarifying and telling you this is exactly what happened, 
Sorry, pal, because there was a lot of chatter, lots of chatter around all of this and a lot of more conversations that I wasn't privy of, privy to between my dad and all three. My dad, you know, Kurt came down and dropped the title to Lawler. So my dad had a deep relationship with Kurt and Scott and Sean. Check this out. A lot of wrestlers were upset that Ru the Russo thing was done as a work on the boys as well especially those who had formerly worked in WCW because it reminded them of falling into that company's patterns. While a lot of the locker room was negative, there was a huge party atmosphere after the show amongst the Russo clan, like they pulled off the angle of the year. <laughs> Do you remember that there being a big celebration backstage? People really feeling it like, man, that was awesome. I don't know if there was a party of the year mentality. Um, that's a little strong. Uh, again, I uh, would be more than imagine that I came through the curtain showered, but business, 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 and what's going on and what do I need to do. And the, you know, obviously went out after the show, but a, a celebration backstage, that sounds, well, I don't say far-fetched because maybe Russo and his crew did. I don't know. Who would, who would Russo and his crew consist of? I, I have to look at the card and, uh, you know, that night that's, that's, that's probably would help me recall anything, but I don't recall any, some big celebratory, you know, did the finish work? We listened to the people. Yes. You can go back and watch it. The people bought into it and we're pissed. Miffed. Russo. Can you believe it? It's finally here. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Unless you get stressed out about how to pay for it. Save with Conrad.com can help you make this the best Christmas ever. You won't make a house payment for the next two months. That's right. Skip your next two house payments and use all that cash for your extra holiday expenses and come next year. You're going to have a lower monthly payment. Don't put Christmas on a credit card. Pay your credit card debt off at save with Conrad.com and MLS number six, five, zero eight, four equal housing lender save with Conrad.com. Russo's return was inevitable and he and Jared had made peace at least a week earlier because Jim Mitchell did the promo of old school wrestling versus sports entertainment on that show, which was designed to be the first hint of the new program. The stories that nobody knew about Russo coming in weren't true, but it's doubtful that any of the wrestlers except Jared and perhaps killings knew, but everyone in the office did. And it was a debated topic over whether or not it was the right ending for that match. Russo really was Panda's choice to run things, except several people complained about Russo on behalf of Jarrett, who never complained himself, and some feel double crossed those who stuck up for him by working with Russo. Let's time out right there. Do you remember anybody like going to bat for you and feeling like, you know, hey man, F this guy, I'm with you, he's trying to take your shit, blah, blah, blah. And then you work an angle with him and they're upset with you? I don't say upset with me, but I mean, the amount of people through the years, and I'm not saying this specific Wednesday night, but I mean, backhanded comments, uh, Hey, serious Russo, as you are well aware is a lightning rod of emotion. People either yep. love, love him or hate him. Yep. And people always wanted to give me their opinion on Hey man, watch that guy, watch that guy. And, and Dutch will tell you more so than anybody. I'm like, Dutch, let, let's just, I'm a big boy. Let's keep on keeping on. Let's And he goes, I'm just telling you, he's working against you. However you want to say it, him and Dickie Dixie are working against you. Mark my words. Well, Dutch turned out to be very accurate through the years, but at the time I just kind of put him, you know, I dismissed it completely. But I don't remember anybody coming up to me and 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 really saying, you know, hey man, I stood up for you, and now you brought this guy back. I don't remember any of that. Reports that Mike Tanay would quit over Russo being in a position of power aren't the case. Although the two have had problems in the past. In WCW, Russo wanted Tanay to do a match with Madeja, and Tanay refused because his contract was as an announcer and not as a wrestler. Management couldn't force him. Russo never forgets, which at some point will mean he'll attempt revenge. Most close to the situation are plugged into wrestling and almost nobody is as plugged into wrestling as today. And he knew that Russo was with them from the start. It also could be that Jarrett was fully aware of the big situation. If you look into the future. So two weeks ago, we talked a lot about Russo in our meeting Dixie Carter episode, but it feels like, man. You just can't win for losing here. Every time you turn around, there's another little landmine. Either it's something you got to look over your shoulder about, 
or the crew thinks they do, right? Very much so early TNA. Very, very much so. Uh, it was just kind of the nature of the beast. Unfortunately, too. Look, do I re regret or resent it? I've gotten through all that. But when you kind of look back on it, Jesus, things were made more complicated than they had to be. Meltzer had this to say. He, talking about you, could either turn things around, which is an impossibility because weekly pay-per-view without television doesn't work, or fail, which was inevitable, and be replaced by Russo. Or he could make peace with Russo and the two keep power. Until their next falling out, which if you remember Bischoff and Russo, is also inevitable. Woo! Woo! I mean, he writes a lot of fiction, but he nailed that shit, did he not? Wisdom. Uh, you know, literally, stoicism philosophy. You just, uh, you study history, you learn a lot. And that is props to Dave on that because of the historical perspective he brings to things. Well, let's talk about the match itself. Um, it's a big time NWA title match. It's in your hometown, Nashville, Tennessee. It's your promotion. You're going to win this belt. You grew up watching. You're going to help establish this Ron Killings persona a little bit in the match. It has a big match feel, special ring introductions, the whole deal. And then you get color during the match. Is that just you growing up a big NWA fan and that's just kind of what you did and you wanted to do it that way? Or what's the thinking to adding a little sauce to the effect? We're playing word association. First thing that comes to my mind is the asylum, Nashville. That's, that's, they love it. It just, it takes the intensity, it elevates, it gets, you know, gets things rolling. Um, and again, how long did it say we went? I felt like we went close to 20. Uh, That's right. It, but, but, you know, it's just, just kind of the, in a build. Uh, so I don't want to say it's what I grew up. Anyway, it was pay-per-view, asylum, NWA world title, the positioning of everything, it fit. It's, uh, it's just fun to go back and take a look at these moments, especially with the benefit of hindsight. Uh, lots of questions about this, uh, Instagram, a wrestling historian, shout out to him wants to know, how did it feel to become the NWA champion? Was it something you even thought about or it registered with afterwards, or you're just back in the grind, man. I mean, when they referenced on there, um, because we did local sports talk radio, yeah. I think we actually, and Joe Biddle, who just passed away, legendary sports writer in the Nashville, you know, in growing up in Nashville, the Tennessean was the morning paper. The Nashville banner was the afternoon paper and I'm dating that myself, but you know, Joe Biddle, but, but we, we did local press and local PR and made a big deal about it. You've already referenced it. Look, I'm third generation. The NWA title was the title, no matter how you slice and dice it going back Fez and, you know, just all the way Harley race and, just name after name after name. So hell yeah, it meant something really special to me. Um, I will say it happened so much quicker. That's what I'm saying in five months. I, I know starting the company, the mindset was let's, because I was, you know, look, we've already kind of documented Hell South and I mean, you name it, a lot of unexpected things happen, but, but I, I know that Scott Hall was a big name that I wanted to go with him. Obviously Shamrock the first night because of how do we kind of differentiate ourselves and the UFC and Kenny's background and everything that went with it. So I, I had four, I, I thought that we would have, I thought it'd be a long time before I came around to being in the world title picture that I was going to work with other guys. It happened quicker. Uh, you know, I know Russo and my father and myself and just kind of things happen. I'm like, yep. Yeah, okay. It fits. Let's roll with it. So it was special without question. Uh, Francis Reyes wants to know, how do you compare winning the NWA title to winning the big gold belt in WCW? Completely different, obviously different set of circumstances. The, it goes without saying now was me winning the big gold belt. It, you know, it's on the, and I don't know what you, when you call the attitude era being over, but it was still, uh, you know, the war was basically over, but it, people didn't know that, but you know, it was still raw nitro 
Yes. Uh, th that whole vibe, that, that was huge. That, that was big in so many ways. And that's the first, you know, that, that's the first time I was ever world champion. That, that was, when I look back on things, big nights in a lot of different ways, that has to be top three, top five um, moments because the big gold belt for that organization at that time, that's like a dream coming true. It didn't get much bigger, you know, when I really put things in context. So completely different. Winning the NWA title in the asylum under my organization, it's big, but it was much more done from a business perspective. Not saying WCW wasn't done from a business perspective, but I had nothing to do with those decisions. I think that is the most simplistic terms. I had zero to do with the WCW decision. And at the end of the day, it's no secret. It was a business decision that I put the final stamp on completely different set of circumstances. Brian wants to know, Jeff, I mean, absolutely no offense when I ask this, but it was a topic of discussion amongst my friends during this period. Did the NWA title still feel like the NWA title? Did it feel to you like Flair's title, Dusty's title, et cetera? I mean, it is no secret that the NWA had fallen on, pardon the pun, Connie, hard times. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it just had. It was not Flair and Harley and Dusty and Dory and Jack, but the lineage from 1905, I said it in umpteen, lots and lots of interviews, was there. So we were in the process of building a brand and rebuilding a lineage or raising the profile. And so that's how the marriage in marriage work between TNA and NWA in the early days is because we both did each other good a definition of a, of a good deal is when it's a win-win. And I think the NWA benefited by being a part of TNA and TNA benefited having the NWA title that we could talk about the, the, the past champions of this championships are A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, Steamboat was on the first show, former champion. Just, I mean, we could go all the way down the line. So, uh, no, it, it wasn't at the level of prestige, but we were in the process of building both. Uh, Brad Stanton wants to know, do you think Ron Killings is doing what he wants to do today in terms of the comedic role? That is a great question because like any talent, especially at his stage or our stage of the game, he's on global television often. That's a win. And yeah. it's unfortunate that he went down with the injury, but Ronnie has charisma that you you literally cannot put a price on you because you just can't manufacture it. He can get talent over by being in the ring with them. Don't have to take almost don't even have to take, say a promo. Ronnie just has charisma. I, th I think I think we discussed this a couple of weeks ago when me and Karen went and saw Stevie Nicks. She's in her seventies and still selling. Uh, lots of tickets, and she's coming back and she's headlining a stadium show with Elton John. Why charisma? She's over. She's She's over. over. I mean, you know, I, I don't see anybody online saying, I can't believe Stevie Nicks is performing at, at a damn stadium. Don't they know that this guy down at, at Tootsie's who can a lot better singer and a lot better player. Don't they know that he should be? No, 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 no. It doesn't, it doesn't that work that way. It, it, it just doesn't that work the way Ron killings is that he is that good. And so whether it's a comedic or serious, Ron has the ability to flip the switch. Now, the question was, do I think Ron? I don't know. You'd have to ask Ron. That's a good question. That, that really is a good question that I don't have the answer for. Only Ronnie does. Uh, Hazard F5 says, I know you have fond memories of the NWA title, but what do you think of the actual design? I've always loved its lineage, but I've never really liked the actual look of the belt with the black painted streaks on the main plate. It just reminds me of a sloth. Where would you rank it amongst the uh, design of the other belts you've held? Buddy, you are asking my partner. Oh, Conrad Thompson could give a lot more educated answer on that. It's the belt. It, it, it's almost like the NFL shield or the NBA logo with Jerry West on it. It's what I grew up on. 
So I never thought, oh, they should change this or change that. I'm not that kind of mindset. I, it, it is a staple. What you say, partner? I'm curious. Just the, 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 what is your thought? I like it because of the history and the heritage, but I don't think it's a particularly nice looking belt. Okay. I just appreciate the history that's with it. Got it. Uh, Carl Hayes has our last question that we'll hit today, or I guess we'll do two more about the NWA and then we'll wrap it up. Growing up, what were your favorite NWA title matches as a fan? And Scott Golden says, who was your favorite NWA champion? And who do you think would have made a good champ that never was one? So let's double down as a, as a young cat growing up, figuring things out. Who was your, uh, who was your favorite NWA champ? It's taking it, a long time to say Ric Flair here. I don't like Rick. I, no, I know. I saw you beat him up in a parking lot. You bastard. <laughs> I, no, I thought you said, was it match or champion? Okay, but, match and champion. Like who's your favorite champion? What's your favorite match? Give me all that. that the, the art of, of emotionally investing live Ric Flair versus Coco Ware in Memphis. And they did a, a kind of a fluke thing where Coco got the shot. But everybody in that arena, including me, thought Coco was going to win. And so I kind of looked at Rick different after that match. Um, so, you know, we can go Garvin and Steamboat and, you know, go to Harley and, 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 and I mean, Briscoe's. I mean, we can say a bunch of different ones, but I, I graduated high school 85. How can you not say the Nature Boy in, in right. Rick? And I'm glad I killed his ass. Made him famous again. Carried his ass. Carried his ass. He hates to admit that. Let's stop. Does he not hate to admit that Jeff Jarrett carried him? I don't know. I can ask him. <laughs> I think he hates to admit that. I'd be glad to ask him on the show. It comes out tomorrow. I'll just bring it up right at the top of the show. You know, last week, he sure didn't have any problem saying that he helped get you over. Oh, I so, see. He took digs at me. That's why. Oh, I, yeah. oh he oh, didn't. Yeah. He, but he, hey, the backhanded compliment. Oh, uh, Jared, it made him more famous. Blah, blah, blah. Hey, but you know, his wife's pretty good talent. <laughs> <laughs> that's I was going to gig you about. That's the most, that's the most Ric Flair sentence of all time. Oh, it is. Uh, next week we're talking ring King, a topic you've been chomping at the bit to cover. You're going to get it early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. In fact, you get all my podcasts early and ad free for just nine bucks a month. That's like pennies per episode every month. Plus, we got tons of bonus content and experiences waiting for you. We just launched a brand new series called The Book, taking a month by month journey through the actual handwritten booking logs of Jim Crockett Promotions and World Class Championship Wrestling with David Crockett using Fritz's old book, uh, or I'm sorry, his brother, uh, Jim Jr., and David Manning using Fritz's old book. So, pretty cool stuff there. Talking about legacy and heritage, we mentioned him at the top of the show, Kerry Morton, son of Ricky Morton who just won his first gold over the weekend. He's got a new program called The Family Business. He's going to be interviewing other second and third generation stars, just talking about their experience of growing up inside the wrestling biz. Maybe you want some uh, one-of-a-kind experiences. We just had a live Q&A with Hacksaw Jim Duggan. We did a live watch along with Jake the Snake Roberts, and we're even doing something. I can't believe this is real. Jim Ross is going to watch the Montreal Screwjob, take your questions, give you some different approaches and reviews. The interactive stuff, I just can't hype it up enough. Go take a look for yourself. See for yourself. It's adfreeshows.com, and uh, stay tuned. I think there's an announcement coming about Top Guy Weekend for 2023 coming soon. Uh, if you dig what we're doing here on the program, I hope you'll throw us a like on this video. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you dig it and want some more. And if you think we earned us earned it, throw us a five-star rating on the platforms. Five stars matter, not just in the Observer, but here on all of your apps where you listen to us. Our Twitter handles, as we're uh, busting each other's balls about college football and a whole lot more, are at Real Jeff Jarrett and at Hey Hey It's Conrad. You can ask a question about Rank and King or anything else over at My World Pod. But the best way to introduce a new listener to our show, maybe get some little bite sized tastes, if you will, is to uh, check us out on YouTube. YouTube.com forward slash My World with Jeff Jarrett. Just like, subscribe, turn on your notifications bell. That's YouTube.com forward slash My World with Jeff Jarrett. And don't forget this weekend. I can't believe this is real. Sting's having his last match. He doesn't know it yet, but he'll know it when he wakes up with a guitar around his head and stitches in the back. 
It's AEW full gear this weekend. You can still get tickets at AEWTIX.com. Watch on pay-per-view like I will be. I think some theaters have it. I think you can also check it out uh, internationally on Fight if you're here in America with us. Bleacher Report's got it and everywhere else. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to see you back on pay-per-view, man. And I hate I'll miss, but I am pumped about all the fun all of our friends are going to have at WrestleCade next weekend. You can pick up tickets to go see uh, Jeff and, and hear some stories we can't tell here on the podcast and do your uh, meet and greets. Jeff's got to get that picture money, baby. Uh, it's uh, wrestlecade.com forward slash tickets for that. Then how did I do shilling all your various? Oh, geez. Stop it. No. I'm up, dude. Dynamite's next. That's on my, that's on my radar next. Oh, that's right. Uh, we should mention that right now. Tomorrow night, you never know what he's going to say or who he's going to knock. And I'll <laughs> save the best for last. You mentioned, can't believe this is real. The banana nose circus. <laughs> I'm just going to lay out and say, what do you mean, Jeff? Oh. What is this banana no circus you're speaking? Huh? <laughs> well, let me a I answer your question with a question. Huh? What do you think I meant? I think you were talking about a fella named Paul. Okay. What was I? What were you talking about? So let's just get right down to it. Okay. Conrad, TV's great. Entertainment's great. But I absolutely, and you're going to relate you, you, I don't, I'm curious to see how you respond to this. I'm glad it's video. Don't, don't you, you better not walk it back right now. No, I'll no, be no, no, so no. disappointed no, in you. No, let me just tell you this much. Okay. I got compassion for Paul. Okay. And I'll tell you why he's on the hot seat. There's no doubt about it. I'd say he's worked and built and planned on taking this job for how long? 10, 15 years? Maybe more, yeah. Maybe, maybe more. And do you think he wanted to step into that role because of a Wall Street Journal article? No chance. Not at all. So with his heart condition and before the article came out, it, he, he was having some tough days. And so he's leading the pack over there. Right? Yeah. So what's the yeah. going to do? I am going to stir it up. And I kind of like the phrase banana nose circus. Don't you? I mean, listen, I, I got everybody talking. So. That, and I'm not supposed to say everything <clears throat> that you just kind of dismiss. Either you love it or you hate it. One right. or the other. But I don't want to throw no sliders or no sinkers. Just go straight fastball. Well, I can't wait to see who you hit with a fastball coming up. Be here before you know it tomorrow <laughs> night, AEW dynamite. And then don't forget boys and girls tune in pay-per-view on Saturday stings. Very last match bingo next week. We're talking all things ring King. How pumped are you? We're finally talking about this. You know what? Because it's ebbed and flow. And I'm just like, Hey man, it is such a kind of off the grain topic. Isn't it Conrad? That, that was kind of my concern from the beginning, but now I think people have got the churn, but folks that don't know this ring King is a television show that was going to be turned into a promotion in India, but it's some of the most fun I ever had putting together a roster that was had to be done in record time. But we went over to India it, it it is some fascinating stories. Scott Steiner was a complete maniac. Some of the best television I've ever produced. Uh, Harbhajan Singh is like the Michael Jordan of cricket, and I had a match against him that we're going to talk about. I mean, that's how big a star he is. We had Sanjay was a big part of that. Rinka King, an Indian-based promotion that aired, and some say because of the network it was on. It's the most watched wrestling program in the history of the business. Ain't that crazy? Yeah. It's amazing, dude. It really is. It is I mean, it's, it's fascinating, uh, you know, India over a billion people. So you have to kind of take things in context, but yes, that, that is a, that is a common known. If you know the history of Rinka King, you know, it was, uh, again, the programming for, for model was so unique, but, uh, it's basically their version of NBC or ABC or CBS. It, it, it's a general entertainment network. And we were on primetime Saturday night, Sunday night for 13 straight weeks. Fascinating, fascinating story. 
Check it out, boys and girls. You're going to love it. Can't wait to talk about it next week and every week right here on my world.